Hi, and welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. I'm Nick Mercer. This is episode 50. Concussion Talk Podcast is presented by Head Check Health. Head Check Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through a sample of powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, and Eastern Washington University and Volleyball Canada who rely on Head Check to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. Okay. This is episode 50, and I'm talking to, right now, Molly Parker. And Molly is a physical doctor of physical therapy. I don't want to call you doctor of physical therapist, because you're not a doctor of physical therapist. You're a doctor of physical therapy. So you're active physical therapy. Yeah. 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 And uh, phys- uh, this, I was talking thing about the... Uh, the uh, the plural like would you call someone like doctor like we call physiotherapist physiotherapist as in plural, but doctor physical therapy doctor physical therapist yep. but you're not doctor physical therapy you're not a doctor physical therapist you anyway that's a <laughs> anyway I'm pointed yeah so there's Molly and uh, she is a doctor of physical therapy and uh, she has actually used her she used her education and her and Copy thousands of hours of research to really help people with come get a, uh, recover from concussions, manage, treat, and uh, and diagnose even. Um, and but also, but the reason she's so committed to this is because she's actually been dealing with post concussion syndrome for the past seven years, eight years now. It's almost eight years, now, is it? Uh, it's gonna be nine in February. Oh, nine. Oh, geez, sorry. Well, nine. Sorry. So nine years. And uh, yeah, since since eleven, since twenty eleven, right? Since twenty eleven. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so be nine years. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah. And so she's been doing that, and the sensory motor disorder. But I will let her des- describe what her, what she went through and and uh, and introduce herself better than I have. So, Molly, please. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Yeah, so I, um, yeah, like you said, I am a physical therapist, and I was working clinically when I had my accident, so I was hit by um, a taxi cab driver in 2011. I was on a crowded sidewalk um, with a big group of friends, and a driver fell asleep at the wheel, and he hit myself and about 20 other people. Wow. Um, And initially, I thought I was very lucky. Where was this? Where is that? This was in San Diego. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, that's it. Yeah. Just to no, you're fine. It, ended, it made um, national news. Like, my parents saw it in Washington, and it was, wow. yeah, just a big, fat mess. Yeah, I bet but, would, yeah, 20 You know, people. I went to the ER, and I did a CT scan, and they x-rayed my legs. Um, and they remember, I remember them sending me home and then seeing in my, the packet that I'd had a concussion, but there really wasn't any follow-up for it. Um, and at the time, I didn't really know what concussions were. I had, I was a pretty recent graduate of school, and we didn't get it in physical therapy school at all. Um, and so I thought I was very lucky, and I thought I was going to be just fine, and people were hurt worse than I was in the accident. And then I basically fell into that really classic post-concussive sequelae um, pretty much immediately. So I started to get um, kind of dizzy, cognitively foggy, off. Um, I was in a lot of pain from getting hit by the car, headaches, um, dizziness. And then I, after about three weeks, had a week where I actually started to feel pretty good. Um, And then I tried to go on a run, had massive pressure in my head, and then went downhill ever since. Um, I started to get headaches that got more severe. Eventually, they were all the time. I started to have memory issues, um, massive fatigue, didn't sleep at all. I started to get kind of confused where I would forget where I was or where I was. I'd have to convince myself that I was in my own apartment. Um, And we didn't understand that it was from the concussion. We knew it was from the accident, but no one knew what post-concussion syndrome or what we're calling it now prolonged concussion symptoms. No one knew what that was. So I got worse for about a year. I eventually started to atrophy all along my left side and get really weak, really painful um, barely functioning, um, ended up going about another year through work, going from person to person, trying to get help. Everyone telling me there's nothing wrong or I should see a psychologist or trying a medication that wasn't going to work. 
And eventually, by about two years, I ended up um, losing my job because I could barely feed myself anymore. I hadn't slept for more than two hours in a night in mm. almost two years. My left side was really weak. Um, I was having a hard time speaking, huge memory problems, um, and could honestly barely feed myself. So I ended up going home for about a month feeling a little bit better, but going back to work too early because I ran out of money. because so I was still, okay. you know, student loans and all that jazz. Um, went back to work too early, crashed again, proceeded to take, you know, another year before I started to find help. By that time, I was bed bound and everything had gone from bad to worse. So by about four years in, I ended up at home completely bed bound. Um, being told I'd be permanently disabled forever, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that there had to be something we could do. And then I started to eventually find people who knew what they were doing um, and start to work my way out. So I've improved probably about 80% since wow. then. Um, but I'm still really struggling functionally. So my days are still pretty minimal and I'm kind of right at that tipping point where I feel a yeah. lot better, but I can't do as much as I would like to do. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with therapy right now, but it's just been, I mean, I've seen probably 90 healthcare providers. It's been nine years. It took two years before they figured out it was a concussion. And it took three years before I even heard of another person like me. Um, and it's just been this overall shattering experience. Now it's turning into something yeah. positive and I've had a lot of growth from it. But I started to do kind of the online educating you were talking about because I was seeing so many people that were ending up like me where they just didn't have the education that they needed to get into the right treatment so they could get, you know, back to their lives. And if I look back and I think if I'd known then what I know now, you know, my recovery would have been weeks and instead it's been years. So I just yeah. appreciate um, people like you and platforms like this so we can spread the word. Great. So is that, is that actually was that where it started from? The yeah, the, the, your your you you saw a lack of education of about concussions yeah. in general, or concussions in, in general. I just the thought that people were going to lose relationships or their jobs or their homes or big quality of life aspects just because they didn't have basic education and no one had ever told them that these things could be treatable or who does it. Yeah. Um, I just, the thought of it makes me feel sick. <laughs> so yeah. That's why I started the online stuff is because I, I physically wasn't well enough to go out and teach because I used to do some teaching. Yeah. Um, and so the only avenue that I could physically do was through social media. Oh, um, it and it's software. ended up being really cool, but you yeah. know, it was just, I had no other way to reach people. So I've seen your, your website, Nagging Cousins, and obviously your, uh, Obviously, your Instagram page at the uh, at, well, at Molly at Molly Parker PT, but it seems yep. it's more of a holistic approach really that you you seem to be every post is I don't want to say every post is different because they're all you know geared towards the same thing, but there are different aspects of. So can you, can you talk about about like the different aspects that you you like to think of as as important as you are not you treat but you dress mostly. The different aspects of concussion recovery? Yeah, as... I mean, we address kind of, and part of it's I take an approach as like a community thing. So there's things that I think are important for everyone. And then I pretty much ask the people in it, like, what do you need? Like, what do you need help with? And that's kind yeah. of what we end up talking about. But it ends up being some clinical stuff, some stuff that helps you, you know, with actual education. And then we go through how do you manage relationships and what does your mindset need to be and all the, like we kind of do the full gamut and some of it's general education and some of it's my personal experience, hoping that people can learn from that or at least hear a bit of their own story in that. Cause I think that always makes people feel comfort. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. Now how did you get to, because I know, because I know as, as, as I mentioned, your site is more and you're in your web and you're uh, in my your Instagram account. Is more holistic and its approach, but uh, you were you were obviously trained as a DPT, so. Um, but mm -hmm. and, but the uh, the like the mindset edge of the you know yoga is physical, but it's also mental. But how did that whole psychological yeah. and uh, mental aspects? How do you how did you why did you come to that? How did you feel that they were so 
that they were so important. Did you, were you taught about that mental aspects as much in physical yeah, school? Yeah, so... Yeah, so we are taught in physical therapy school, you know, there's kind of this old school model that's like basically biomechanics, where if you get hurt, it's the knee joint, it's the muscle. Um, and I started after I graduated working in what we call the biopsychosocial medical model. So it takes into account the whole human um, and how the brain processes all the input and our emotions and our thoughts and our preconceived notions and, you know, everything um, to create movement and how we feel and pain and things like that and pre-accident the clinic I worked in we did a lot of chronic pain and we did a lot of autoimmune type stuff and then we did a lot of people who really didn't quite fit into a box um, where they would have like this shoulder problem but it was a little funky and no one could really treat it and we started to find that it was these underlying um, what we call biopsychosocial medical model where it's not just that the brain, that there's like mechanical injuries, that there's more to it than that. Um, so when I would approach someone with chronic pain, yes, we're approaching, you know, strengthening the muscles. Yes, we're looking at yeah. the way you move. We're looking at how often you move. But we're also looking at how the brain is perceiving threat and how your emotions play into that um, and how kind of, you know, your whole day plays into that because pain in general is an output. So we basically were taking in all the information from the world and your brain is deciding whether that's a threat and to produce pain or not. So when we treat people with chronic pain, we need to treat all components of that to kind of resolve it and get them to move through. And then when I started with the concussion stuff, I started seeing a lot of similarities with how I would treat kind of these chronic pain, these sensitive nervous system type people with the people going through concussion recovery. And then in my own recovery, I started to see instances of stuff that my chronic pain people would tell me, like, I would go over a speed bump and I would get a massive headache. And mechanically, that shouldn't be happening. No. You know, you're not jarring yourself enough over a small speed bump to get any sort of symptom output like that. And basically what that is, is just an oversensitized nervous system. So if we can start to address some of our triggers and some of the emotions involved with that and really take that big picture approach, that's what tends to be more helpful, especially for people with the prolonged cases, is that it's this big picture thing of getting your whole nervous system to really feel safe again. Um, and then I think from personal experience, you know, we can say all the right things people can do, all the right exercises but it's mentally really challenging to lose yeah. that much of your life and to be in rehab all of the time and to have that change all your relationships. And you really, I think the long game is kind of a mental game. And so you it really is, have yeah. to have I, your, your head right to be able to go more. through. And so we make sure we give people those tools. Do you have any other, any other like, uh, and no, you know, I saw on your website exactly you do, you know, you do yoga. We used to do yoga a lot. Do you have any other, any other uh -huh. physical, any other or meditation? Do you meditate or do do yoga? Or, well, I know you do yoga, yes, but do you meditate as well or any of the mental tricks? Yeah, you, I did yoga. Yeah, I did yoga a ton before the accident, and I've struggled to do it as much since. Um, I do a little more of like the yin style yoga, but yeah. I did very much get into meditation, which has been hugely, hugely helpful. Um, so now I meditate every day and that's one of my favorite go-to things that people can do at home when they're in recovery is learn you how just, to kind of calm that down. You just do that alone in like, in like a dark room or you just sit, lie down? Like I think I meditate. I don't do anything intentionally, but I think I meditate just by like lying down somewhere and just thinking about stuff and nothing. I don't do anything with that body. I just lie there and just think about stuff and just, I don't try to do it. I just, that's just my mind just wanders a lot and not wanders wanders but wanders with the yeah. focus if I should say if I can say that but <laughs> I probably yeah. can't but you know um before yeah, you because like, you... when I started say again oh no I was going to ask you another question but no keep going please oh um when I started I didn't know how to meditate like I'd heard people talk about it but I ended up using an app called Headspace and they uh -huh. had like little intro things. And so I did that 
And then the more I've gotten into it, the more I kind of play with it. So I do some that are just breathing and some that are more guided. And I do some specifically for like fatigue when my body's really achy. Um, but yeah, and just kind of figure out what I like. I want to like. ask you about uh, the, the, the fatigue more because that's one thing that I, I don't struggle with as much now, but I did a lot when I, I do, I do and have it when I do a lot when I was first injured. But um, also when you were mentioning before earlier, you're saying the 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 threat, the pain, the threat, and uh, and the like biopsychosocial medical model, and uh, uh-huh. that's actually in December. I talked the first actually early December. I talked to Joseph Adu, who is like the the fear, one of the big like, He's a professor of of uh, and he's like not professor of anxiety, but he's a professor of psychiatry, neuros, neuropsychiatry and and uh, neuro uh-huh. neuropsychological stuff at uh. NYU and he talks about he has a bunch of models about fear and fear and fear and anxiety and like and the amygdala and uh, that center of the brain so it ties into that but also the biopsychosocial model biopsychosocial biopsychosocial model there you go biopsychosocial uh-huh. medical model right um, that's actually I first heard that from Megan Adams who is a she was on a podcast podcast before she's on Instagram is one brain neuro and uh oh, okay. she's a she yeah, she's a physical therapist. She talks about how the how uh the biopsychosocial model is or is she uses that for her her own research. She's also a physical therapist, but yeah. a PhD researcher, so yeah. That's very yeah. that's usually a common theme, but that, that just because, I mean is it was a physical injury, like it was in your question in my brain too were physical but it's also, I mean, they comes to biopsychosocial, this says it all, I mean, you can prove that, but uh, the, the whole, the, the day is more psychological and mental, and, and that's so, so, so important for recovery as well. But, uh, but, uh, you're talking about I'm starting to lose you a little bit, it's getting kind of fuzzy. I don't need to talk too much. Being a bit, I'm not that, 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 but uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, thing you're saying, you're saying about, saying, but how, how can you describe, describe, try to describe, describe the thing, the thing, the thing, how that you, how that has affected your life, your the way you do yoga or work or whatever. Or my little. Yeah, I can hardly hear you. It's um all scratchy, like the microphone. Okay, is uh that is that better? Is that okay, is it changing anything? Oh yeah, that helps. Right here. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay, okay, I'll do this. Um, yeah, you can see me now too. Um, we well, can see me over it. Yeah, the fatigue model, fatigue and uh, and how you how you run your life now with the, with this fatigue issue. With you, all the fatigue, you, yeah, the fatigue, fatigue is fatigue? the worst. Can you describe the do how you what you feel like how for the people who don't know what the fatigue of the brain injury brain injury yeah. feels like? Yeah. Yeah, so the fatigue, I think the important thing to understand that I think my friends and family struggled with is the fatigue that we're talking about that people are experiencing in concussion and along the spectrum of brain injury is not the same fatigue that healthy people are experiencing. Um, So neural, and we call it neurological fatigue. So neurological fatigue, um, it feels almost more like you have the flu. It feels like really achy body Um, almost like you need to be taken out on a stretcher and people tend to have significantly lower energy levels and that can be anywhere on a spectrum depending on the person Um, but so people are pretty much taking more energy to do basic things and fatiguing a lot faster and for some people that could look like they get two hours a day and for other people they could get closer to 10 Um, but it's basically you fatigue much easier and it's more of like that achy body, your nervous system shutting down, your symptoms feeling worse type thing. Um, and it's something really common that we see in neurological injuries, but it's been, yeah, it's so frustrating because you have so much that you'd like to do in a day that you just physically can't get through. Um, so for me in initially I would push through it 
which I now know was not what I was supposed to do. So I used to, you know, feel my body shutting down and just keep going. And I think in the long run, that made my recovery a little bit longer. And now I do better at kind of respecting those energy reserves and try to keep myself where I'm feeling good and recharge as I need. Um, But yeah, I have to be very, very, very intentional with my time and how I schedule my days and that the activities I'm doing are the most important ones because you just don't get as much energy to do stuff in a day as you do, you know. Do you find that's improved? Is that that also, do you find that's improved, changed since you first were first injured, first felt these post-concussion symptoms? Yeah, I used to get... I used to get where I'd get really fatigued and I would push through and I would do what I'd call, I'd call them crashes where your whole nerve, it feels like your whole body's just shutting down and all your symptom get, symptoms get worse and you just feel awful. And it used to take me two weeks to recover from those kind mm. of things. And now it takes me maybe like two or three hours if I really, really, really massively overdo something, maybe a day, but it's nowhere near as severe as it once was. I'm not as fatigued throughout the day as I once was. Um, and I recover much faster than I used to, but I think stamina is still one of my, one of my more limiting things. Can you said that has improved though, but so is there one thing you can mm-hmm. point to that you think is a cause or that's helped you? Or do you think it's just a general time and all that and all your work you've done? Um, it was a combination. I don't think it was time because I think I didn't, um, I didn't start to feel better with time. I kept pushing through it and I actually yeah. felt like I got worse the further okay. I went into it. Yeah. So I think the two big things were first is I started to plan and pace my days much better. So rather than constantly pushing through and crashing and not respecting my body's, you know, symptoms, I started to learn how to, um, work with that threshold a little bit better. So I stopped pushing through, I started to find ways that I could be active without, you know, overdoing it too much. And then the second part was starting to get my symptoms treated. So the more I got things treated, the more energy I started to have, especially with any vision stuff. I started to get a lot more energy when my eyes started working better. And then with my movement disorder stuff, when I stopped shaking as much, I started to get a lot more energy too. Um, So yeah, it's been planning and pacing my days and, and then it's been treating the underlying causes. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had I've had double vision since my brain injury in '03, and mm-hmm. I think I can feel that if once if I close up one eye, like you, as you can see, I'm doing now, but no one else can. But uh, yeah, if I close one eye, this is fine. Then I think I feel that I would have a lot more energy if I just did just did this all the time. But that'd be annoying. Yeah. Again, the yeah. wearing a patch over would be just I wore a patch for a while. In, when I was in Riyadh. Yeah, me too. And uh, did it, this, they didn't really know. This was 03, so I didn't really know what if it would do anything, but I thought it, that I could, so I tried it. Uh-huh. It didn't, didn't really work. It obviously didn't work. I still had double, double vision. But, um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. It's just, I can see how the, when you're, you get control of your vision better, you can definitely reduce your symptoms and symptoms of fatigue. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, I was going to ask you Do about you still it. get quite a bit of fatigue? Um, not, not nearly as much as I used to, because I, I, I get fatigue from, like, example, now, I was talking to Molly before this podcast, but for those who don't know, I live in St. John, Newfoundland, and uh, we got a whole bunch of snow on Friday, and uh, there's, like, nothing operating. It's a state of emergency in the city of St. John's. It's a state of emergency. But, so the, but I went for a long walk yesterday, like two hours, just I was out around to see what see what was going on. Probably shouldn't have, but uh, and that was long, and I, that really that really that weighed me up for the today. I'm still so tired from that, and feel that look like my legs. But I do I do a lot of physical activity now, so I think I've kind of trained the fatigue out of me a bit, which kind of leads me to the, mm-hmm. the, my question about neuroplasticity. But I'll get that after. But um yeah, but yeah, I've been doing really yoga and Pilates and swimming and. And uh, I swam a lot before and now, and I still, I still swim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, I'm, I do that. I, and I noticed when swimming, as swimming has gotten, I'm fa- I'm faster and I can I'm stronger in the water. And I feel like that's not just muscles coming back, but it's also my, 
stamina. Well, not really, not to say my lung capacity, obviously, but my whole like physical well-being. And uh, I still do it. I still do it a bit of a day, like late in the day. I just want to just. I just want to go home and just lie down, eat dinner, eat food, and just or like watch TV, read a book, and just fall asleep early. But uh, it's not always like when you're young. I'm um, I'm almost forty, but uh, I still call I still call it young. But uh, uh, anyway, when mm-hmm. you're, you don't when I was injured, I was 23, and they don't want you don't want to do that when you're the that age. You don't want to just go home at like eight in the morning, eight in the evening, eight, eight, eight p.m. and just go to sleep or just you know you want to be out and so it's that that's tough yeah. but uh but um yeah so that and you get you still get a lot of fatigue or saying like you're able to do you have a, a time of your day that you're just like okay that's it for me i'm done or do you just our time of hours or does i pick a it kind of day depends or? on how like how my day's gone and what i've been doing for how quickly i kind of crap out like some activities are more fatiguing for me than others like if I'm out driving and I'm in crowded places and I'm talking to people, that's more fatiguing for me quicker than if I'm doing, you know, stuff around the house. Um, and then I think the second piece for me that you touched on that's super important is exercise. Um, so I think the initial model for concussions was rest and don't do much. And now we know it's like active rehabilitation. Exercise is phenomenal. So part of my problem is I'm so deconditioned because I spent so many years where my movement disorder was so bad. My dysautonomia was so bad that I could barely stand up or get out of bed. Um, so now I'm super deconditioned. So I'm working with a PT right now and we're trying to get back into aerobic exercise. And so I'm on a program on the recumbent bike right now. And then eventually like you said, swimming, I used to love to swim. So like, that's something I'd really like to get back into. Um, but yeah, that's the other piece is it's, the neuro fatigue, but then it's also I'm just super deconditioned. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, it's a little both. Okay, well, can I was doing that? So just can you hear me now? Is this because I don't have my hand on the microphone? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So I'm just <laughs> eyeing my time. input stream there. But um, yeah, this my on uh Phoenix 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 concussion podcast where I do with Lauren Zax. We did one uh-huh. on episode ten was about dysautonomia. And uh, oh, perfect. A physical therapist in, in Utah, and so she talked a lot. But that was a that was not a longer podcast. That was like forty some odd minutes, but it was a great one. And uh, so you explain what dysautonomia is. Of course, now people listen to physical listen to physical concussion podcast will know, but you know, everyone else may not. So dysautonomia. Yeah. Um, so basically with dysautonomia, usually your brain helps, like your brain stem reticular helps regulate your heartbeat. So when we have folks with dysautonomia, we most commonly see something called POTS, which is, um, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. Yeah. So basically their heart rate isn't being regulated like it ought to. So it's getting super high with positional changes. So like when I used to stand up, my heart rate would be like. 180. And yeah. So faint. people get dizzy. They feel funky. Some people faint. Um, and so I think it's one of those things. It was missed in me for seven years. And then mm-hmm. I think I figured it out myself eventually, which is a lot of things I ended up figuring out myself and then getting myself to the right yeah. place. Um, but it was extremely fatiguing. It was really hard to be upright. It was really hard to walk. And then treatment for that looks like kind of a multi-pronged approach. There's the medical approach, which is um, adjustments in diet. So it's a volume issue when you stand up, you're not getting enough blood flow to the brain. Um, So it's salt intake can help increase that volume, salt and water intake, which is done with a physician. Um, There can be some medications. There's things like compression socks so that as your blood kind of drops down to your feet, it's helping to pump it back up where you need it. Um, And then I found functional neurology and exercise programs to be the other most helpful part um, for me. So I found that like just the diet and the adjusting my positions and medications weren't helpful enough. I found functional neurology and then an exercise program through physical therapy to be most helpful for me. And now my POTS is gone for the most part. Oh, you did that POTS. I was just listening. I just saw you wrote dysatonia, which is 
and the dysautonomia you can have is is a blanket term uh, Lauren's saying yes. for a bunch of different types mm -hmm. so uh, is yeah. there is, is dysautonia which I think I thought I read on your webpage dysautonia is that the type of oh dystonia dystonia sorry yeah, yeah dystonia yeah that's right that sounds right that sounds better than the last thing yes yeah, so I had the dystonia is basically kind of another blanket umbrella term for um, it's, it's basically translate into like bad movement. Um, but it was basically I had involuntary movements throughout the body. So a true dystonia tends to be involuntary movements that most people can't control. And it's kind of like a twisting and torsion. You see it a lot in the neck. Um, it can be generalized. Um we ended up, I never fit a true category because um, I could hold mine in and control them a little bit, but they were going all the time. Um, and that has been the hardest thing to treat in my recovery by far. Um, so I ended up actually at a clinic at UCLA that has been mm. most helpful. Um, but I think that's one of those things where the movement problems are still a little underdiagnosed in concussions. And I don't think people are still getting to the right yeah. spot. Um that's one that I really wish I would have gotten the handle on much oh, sooner. Good. Yeah. And uh, before you're answering that, uh, I was going to say, I forgot to say uh, that, but uh, so let's move on to neuroplasticity then. Uh, you're, so, mm -hmm. uh, cause you may, and you're, and you're on your website and you're navigating, navigating concussions site. Uh, you mentioned that neuroplasticity is a, is a key part of your, of the, your treatment, your, your five, Five different mm -hmm. things you look need to look at diet and education and way well, it's education another thing I wanted to ask you about. But uh yeah, so you talk about neuroplasticity and how that can help people with uh, concussion or severe traumatic brain injury. What what parts of neuro neuro rehabilitation are really really yeah effective at that? Yeah. So neuroplasticity is basically the idea that our brain is not hardwired, um, that it can change with the input we give it at any point throughout, you know, throughout life. And when we apply it to concussion recovery, it means that just because you have symptoms, however far out, it doesn't mean that that's what you're stuck with. So the old actually with neurological injuries was that if you don't improve after two years, you're not going to improve anymore. And that's it. That. And we're finding that's not the case at all. Yeah. Um, I think almost all of my recovery came after five years. So it's just this idea that if we give the brain the proper input, that it can make, it can make changes. Yeah. Um, the thing to remember with neuroplasticity is neuroplasticity is really neutral. So it just changes based on the input we yeah. give it. So um, no, you want to give it. Yeah. Another example of, yeah, another, I mean, another example of neuroplasticity is chronic pain. Like, yeah. that's neuroplasticity that didn't really go in our favor. Um, yeah. So it's partly it's getting the correct treatments, and then it's um, anything from our thoughts can change the way our brain perceives things. Um, and in rehab, we tend to, there's proposed stages of neuroplasticity. So when we tend to have someone who's gone through these long recoveries and they're really looking to make positive changes in their brain, we tend to have people start by just cleaning up the brain. So it's um, basically calming down what's called microglia, which is inflammation in the brain, usually through diet and staying hydrated and a little bit of exercise so that brain is primed and ready um, to be ready for it so that people can make changes you know, as quickly as, as possible. But it basically means that you know, no matter how far out you are, you can still make positive changes because your brain has the ability to change through neuroplasticity. I actually just started seeing my, my first, when I went on my first book, one of my first physiotherapists after my brain injury, Jen Shears, which I, I mm -hmm. had just when I was first going to the outpatient rehab. And uh, I just started seeing her another another clinic just two weeks ago. And uh, I noticed just she gave me some homework, homework to do and I made, I think, great Change uh, improvements in my stability, stability, and my just yeah strength of my of my uh, not it's necessarily strength of my core, but like my stability and my uh, reaction of my of my muscles and my or nerves and my legs and feet and all that stuff. So I feel and that and it's been, geez now seven almost seventeen years since 
16, mm-hmm. 16 and a half years since my injury. So, yeah, I mean, I, I believe in neuroplasticity completely. I mean, I'm not believing it because it's not anything to believe. It just it happens, but it's just a... But anyway, um, yeah, but I want to ask you about first years of your education. Because you, I mean, you mm-hmm. were very educated. You know about the uh, how, like, the body works and uh, what, it, what sort of help you, you would need that you, when you were injured, you were, you, you finally thought, they, you looked first, first of all, at the place that didn't, you didn't know what to look for, and they, and they, people told you different things, and you didn't know, didn't know what to look for, but, obviously, mm-hmm. you're smart and educated, so, and educated in the right area for recognition, so, you, you knew yourself how to find what you needed, what you, what you were educatedly, and research thought you needed, it, but, you started your, your, uh, online program your your instagram and your and your home and your website instagram is mm-hmm. at, Mar- at molly parker pt anyway website is navigating yep. navigating questions is there a better way to uh you can on instagram you can click the bio my Great. regular website is going to be molly parker pt.com but right oh. now it's hosted through another site so it's this gigantic mouthful and i think oh. it's like Concussion yeah. backslash Molly Parker PT slash TBI. So I think it's like it's my partner dot concussion or something like that, or it's like concussion dot Molly Parker or something like that, or it's like it's weird. Uh, I know Jean, it's weird. It's a weird one, yeah. Yeah, it's but, a big uh, fat. But anyway, but I you, can give it the link if you want. I think you should. That'd be good. Or just you can go to go to her Molly, Molly's Instagram page and Molly, Molly did I lose there Molly Parker PT and click on her bio uh-huh. and. uh but uh, I want to ask first about the uh, yeah because you know you know where to look for for help, but for people who do don't people who don't necessarily know or even have didn't have like maybe very educated but may not even have the the physical therapy aspect know where to look for the medical aspect at all man I know where to look for help and does that why you started your 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 blog and your your, your website and your Instagram account. And how yeah, do you... so that's. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, uh, nothing. I just. I interrupted you. No, you didn't interrupt me at all. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I started. Was the question why? Why that was that? Why it was started? Yeah, yeah. The gap you said. I just didn't mention actually on your part. Yeah, the gap so education. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why that was started. And just like I still I get messages a lot from people being like, here's what I struggle with. Like, who do I see? And I'll direct them to kind of the healthcare provider that does that. Um, What I'm starting to see now is now that I've been doing it for a year and a half, the Instagram stuff is really helpful. And it gives people a lot of information that they didn't have. And a lot of people say they still learn stuff from there that they haven't been told by their healthcare providers yet, which is crazy. Um, And that it helps them feel connected. But I'm also finding that people need more structure. So I'm working on a program right now that'll be um, hopefully ready come March that'll help give people much more structured care. We'll we'll, we'll do all the research for you and help give everything um, kind of in a structured format to help talk you through the process for people that want to dive in a little bit deeper. Um, But for right now, it's all on social media through Instagram and Facebook. Um, and if you have questions, just ask me because I make posts based on what people are wanting to know. You make a lot of posts too. So, um, and also, do you, I mentioned when I wrote to you about being on the podcast, but the, I want to talk to you about coping skills. You were mentioning uh-huh. you, had a, you had a you first have a top ten list on your on your website. You have a top ten coping skills or something like that on your that you can sign up uh-huh. for the newsletter for. But uh, so are coping skills the same? The same as just you know, exercise and 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 mental aspects of it, or is this, or is there a list of different coping skills that are? Here is there mental? Is more, is there more of a mental skills that you need to know to for coping skills? For these coping skills. They're a little right? bit of both. So the coping skills right now, I have the top ten concussion coping skills that I found yeah. just throughout my recovery that I wish people would have told me earlier on because it's stuff that once you hear it you're like oh that makes sense and that would make things easier but you just don't think about it while you're going through it so it's a mix of kind of tips and tricks so to speak along with kind of the mental aspects so I'll give you guys a few examples like one is time versus task so when I first started 
the example I always use is my sister got married on the top of a mountain and they mm. skied down. And so we were making these little like ski boutonnieres and we were putting mm. like we physically, my sisters and I were, you know, made them. Um, and so I'm putting together these boutonnieres and I have this pile I want to get through. And I kept going through, I wanted to go till I was done. And I remember by the time I was finished, I was so sick and I was so dizzy. Yeah. Um, and I ended up having to lay down for like 24 hours before I stopped spinning. And so time versus task is basically you're doing something for 10 minutes versus until I finish. So you're doing the laundry, say you start to fatigue at 30 minutes, you're doing the laundry for 25. It's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So it's stopping yourself before you push past that mark. That was a hugely helpful one for me. Um, that ties into another example. Fatigue, yeah. That would ties in, that ties into your fatigue as well. Yeah. So when you start to manage with these coping skills, it can help reduce your fatigue. It can help reduce your frustration. It can help you navigate your days a little bit easier. Um, and it's just giving you kind of how to navigate the world when you're in your concussion recovery and some Sorry. tips for that. And those are free um, on my Instagram. There you go. Perfect. Is there anything else you'd like to mention to listeners about your report to find you out of conduct to or or where to chat with you? Uh, I think the main one is through Facebook and Instagram and then keep your eyes peeled for March. Hopefully we'll have um, a program coming out for people who are really needing more that will help support their rehab. And eventually further. And eventually the August the website will be Molly Parker PT. Yeah, com? eventually it'll be mollyparkerpt.com. If you go to that now, is it just nothing, or is it like redirect you to? Because if redirect, uh, redirect I think it's it just, just good. has nothing. So the real website is like concussion backslash backslash like the HTTP. Just, just go to your go to Instagram. Go to your Instagram. Yeah, go to the Instagram. Go to Instagram. Yeah. Um, it's just a. It's a landing page right now, so they have it as a placeholder. So it's yeah. It's so sad. We'll get that all worked out. Oh yeah, I bet you will. Yeah, you got a good following yeah. there on Instagram at least. So hopefully, hopefully, a lot of people people who hear this. I mean, I think everybody here just probably knows about your Instagram handle already. But uh, but if they don't, then that's a great place to check out. Like I thought, it's like coping skills and other interesting things about neuroplasticity and diet and. Uh, and just and education, just general education about concussions. Well, not general education, but education about what you can do if you've had a concussion or you're suffering from post-concussion syndrome. So uh, thank you yes. so much, Molly, for coming on by my podcast. This is great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks again to Molly Parker, and thank you all for listening. I would actually like to encourage you all to please visit my website, at www.concussiontalk.com I also hope that you could please rate, review, subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, whatever, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you can do that. So any any sort of review or subscription would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. I hope you listen again soon. As always, the music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound, www.bensound.com.